Hello AP Bio students, we're gonna have to do something a little different today. Um, with the icy conditions, we don't have class, but we still have a lot of work that we need to get done. The last day of school might be pushed back, but the big AP test is not, so we really have to get some of this stuff covered. So today, I need you to do a few assignments. This is the same stuff that my period two and period three, my A-Day classes did last Friday. I'm gonna have you guys do a similar assignment uh, but it's going to be a little bit different, a little bit shorter, because you're not going to be able to share out to the whole class. So let's go ahead and get started. Last week, we were talking about gene regulation and specifically these operons, which allow uh, really simple cells to be able to turn on and off the production of an enzyme. Uh, based on whether or not some chemical is present. So they're able to recognize and sense the world around them and make some response to that. This discussion about gene regulation and operons was very focused at the DNA level, uh, but in today's lesson, we're gonna be taking a step back and talking about how the whole cell works to recognize and respond to chemicals in its environment. Specifically, we're talking about signal transmission. Signals can be anything in living systems. Uh, they can be the sounds that you're hearing, the physical movement of air that's entering your ears. Uh, it could be light photons, um, but typically in living things, chemicals are the main signal. Um, so we're gonna be focusing mostly on how chemicals signal and cause a change in the cell. Uh, the big idea here is that some signal in a living organism will find its way into a cell and it will mediate or turn on or off the expression of some gene. It'll turn on and off the protein that that gene codes for. And when that protein is made, that changes the cell function. It changes what the cell is able to do. So again, some signal will be able to tell a cell what to make and essentially tell a cell what to do. These signals, as I said, can be lots of different things, um, but they can also come from different places. Sometimes they can come from within a cell um, or from outside of a cell. When we were looking at the LAC operon and the TRIP operon, um, LAC, the lactose, uh, that was coming from outside of a cell. The experimenters were adding lactose, the cells were recognizing that and producing a change. Uh, the trip operon, that tryptophan is being made within a cell. Uh, the cell is able to sense if it has enough tryptophan within it, and if it doesn't, it will go through a change and make more tryptophan. So these signals can be from within or outside of a cell. And the long description of it is that some signal will make its way into a target cell and eventually go down into the DNA level. The DNA then will go through protein synthesis. It will transcribe and translate some new protein, and that protein produces the desired cell function, desired uh, job that, that the signal was trying to trigger. Um, but just like in our description about lactose, where Jacques Monod's initial thought was that lactose directly interacted with the DNA and turned on the production of the lactose enzyme, he was stuck on that idea, and it was wrong. Um, eventually, he figured out that there was another molecule, an intermediate step, uh, lactose repressed a repressor molecule, and that repressor molecule uh, was able to actually interact directly with the DNA. Same thing in these signals. This signal molecule will interact with a protein on the surface of a target cell. That receptor protein will activate some other protein, which will activate another protein, which will activate another protein, which will activate another protein, which will eventually interact with the DNA directly. So it's this cascade of proteins that are being uh, turned on um, in response to that initial signal molecule. The signal molecule is way over here, and it turns on this series of proteins that eventually interact with the DNA. Now, this is a very general mo model of 
signal transmission, I'm not naming these different proteins because they're different proteins for every different signal that's out there. They all use a different set of proteins and you don't have to memorize any of them. You just have to be able to recognize that this signal reacts with another protein, which reacts with another protein, which eventually, step by step, will eventually get to the DNA. That DNA will then go through transcription, translation, which makes the protein, the protein does the actual job. So it's there are multiple steps along the way. It's not one signal, one protein. It's not that straight. Um, there are a lot of other steps. Okay, that's pretty much it. That's all seg signal transmission. What I'd like you guys to do, though, is attempt to apply that information. So I've also sent you a link to a diagram. It's called the Signal Transmission Concept Cartoon. And it has this model here um, of some signal transmission. I'm gonna want you guys to uh, do a thing with it and submit that to me when I see you guys next time on Wednesday. So here's the idea. P53 is a protein. And it regulates, it turns on and off a response whenever there is DNA damage. So there's DNA damage on some gene on, in some other location in the cell. That DNA damage is the signal. It goes down these protein cascades and then does something. It does whatever is being described in this model. So here is the document that I'm going to be sending to you. It has that same model. And I'll read the description up here. It says, the P53 protein regulates a cellular response to DNA damage. Four students are arguing about how this process works. Based on data from their own research, they've created this diagram here. However, their interpretations of this diagram differ. Which of the following claims, there's one student here, is another student, student three, and then student four down here, which claim best describes the role of P53 in response to DNA damage, and why do you think the other claims are wrong? So what I want you guys to do is read through these four different claims and try to figure out which claim best describes this model and explains how P53 works. So again, I want you to tell me which of the students, which of those four claims do you agree with? Also describe why do you agree with that claim? What is it about their claim that is connected best to this model? And also, why do you disagree with the claims, the other three claims? When you're saying why you disagree, if you say something like, eh, it's the shortest, eh, it doesn't have enough information, that's not a very good reason to disagree with that information. Be more specific. Tell me what information is missing or what information is wrong about each of the three claims that you disagree with and what's most right about the claim that you do agree with. That is your assignment. Well, that's your first assignment. The second assignment is actually uh, quite a bit shorter. Um, it's a lot more opinion based. Um, so, but for right now, pause this video right here. And I want you to go do that thing. Um, find the link. I put it down in the doobly doo. And uh, I also sent it to you. So do the signal transmission thing, and then come back and watch the rest of this video. Okay, welcome back. Let's go ahead and move on. So the we're going to be changing gears a little bit. We're going to be moving away from specific signal transmission and gene control, and we're going to start to get a little bit bigger. Uh, the last homework that you guys did, part of it was talking about genotypes and phenotypes. Uh, in that, we were talking about how genotypes, the DNA, when there's a change in the DNA, like a mutation, uh, the DNA code, the A, T, Cs, and Gs become a different sequence, that causes a phenotypic change in the organism. The DNA changes, which causes the protein that that gene codes for to become different. When you have a different protein, 
that protein will interact differently in the body, give a different cell function and a different um, ability for the organism. Uh, sometimes those abilities are good, sometimes they're bad. We'll talk about that. Um, but that's going to be the topic that we're moving on to. And this is actually going to be the final for this semester. We're going to be answering this big question. Is diversity good or bad? That's it. Just that one question. And I'm going to have you guys uh, be doing a few investigations, um, collecting some data, doing some real science to get uh, evidence to be able to answer this question. Is diversity good or bad? So today, um, on this icy day out there, we need to do a little bit of uh, introduction work on this question uh, before we can actually start doing a lab, which we're going to start on Wednesday. That's why I'm having you rush through all this, even though we don't have school. It's because we have to get to this lab. Whenever we are doing an argument, it's always good to frame your question. It's good to make a working definition of the terms that we're using. So this term here, diversity, what does that mean? You might initially think, you know, differences. There are different things and different things, and that's great. Uh, you know, a rock is different than a human. Those are different things. Uh, Dylan is different than uh, Donald Trump, which is good. It's good that Dylan isn't Donald Trump. Um, that is diversity. Unless we set some boundaries on what we're talking about, it would be too broad of an idea to really discuss. Like, air is different than coffee. Those are different things, but they're so different that it doesn't really help us to discuss anything. So we're going to set some boundaries on what we're talking about. Specifically, we're going to be talking, when we talk about diversity, we're going to be focused down at the population level. So we're going to be talking about a group of organisms, biological organisms, that are all of the same species that live in one area, like our classroom is a population of humans. Portland is a population of humans. We're going to be looking at different populations of one species and being able to tell whether or not the diversity within them is good or bad. And when we talk about the diversity in them, we're going to be talking specifically about genetic diversity. Um, the difference in genes, which can be inherited... Um, is that a good thing? Is it good that some of us have different genetic codes than the rest of us? Okay, so here's your second um, assignment for today. I want you in your science notebook, so you might want to go grab that. Go ahead, I'll give you time. Okay, in your science notebook, I want you to write the question, is diversity good or bad? Just write that out. And then make a T-chart where you have good on one side and bad on the other. And then I want you to consider some ideas uh, for each of the sides. Why might genetic diversity within a population be a good thing? Why might genetic diversity in a population be a bad thing? And I want you to write some ideas. doesn't have to be full sentences. doesn't have to be like a well-constructed, well-supported idea. We'll get to that later. Right now, just jot down as many ideas as you can. And I also want you to consider how you might be able to defend, what evidence you might be able to use to support the idea that diversity is good or that diversity is bad. Give me an example of how uh, genetic diversity might be a bad thing. Um, and as you go through writing down those ideas, both good and bad, um, I also want you to consider any questions that you'd want to ask in order to uh, be able to answer this question, is diversity good or bad, better. So write down any questions, um, write down what you'd want to know in order to help you answer, is diversity good or is diversity bad. So once you have that T-chart done, that's it, you're done. After that, we'll be able to come back together as a whole class. Um, we'll do this on Wednesday. We'll compile our chart, um, discuss some of the, the details, and be able to move on and start our lab. So to review, there are three things that you need to get done by Wednesday. One, 
is the signal transmission concept cartoon. Two was the list of good or bad uh, arguments for or against diversity in a genetic population. And three is your normal homework Cornell notes that I have you assign. I'll send that link out uh, soon after I send out this link. There's a fourth. Yeah, I know. Okay, this last one's uh, a little bit easier and more fun. Um, on Thursday, I have the opportunity to send some students on a field trip to OHSU. Um, it's going to happen between second period and third period on Thursday, so uh, you might miss those, um, but seniors can't go. Only sophomores and juniors. Um, so you're, if you're a sophomore or a junior, um, you might be able to go on this field trip. Um, ask your parents uh, right now if, if that's okay. Um, and then the trickiest thing is that you'll need to come get a permission slip from me on Tuesday. So it'll be an A day, but you'll have to find me to get this permission slip. And then you'll need to bring it back by Wednesday. So only one day turnaround to... Uh, get this permission slip back to me. I don't have uh, the permission slips as a digital copy, and so I can't send them to you right now. Um, but yeah, you'll need to do that. So this field trip, uh, we're going to take a bus down to OHSU. Um, once there, we're going to talk to the scientists and doctors at OHSU, see what their jobs are, and also see what uh, students do who come there to do university, do, do, do college work. Um, and so it's sort of a recruitment thing for sophomores and juniors. They assume seniors have already decided what college they're going to, so they're not bothering with seniors. Um, so sophomores and juniors, come on down, check it out, see if you want to uh, apply in the future. Um, they'll provide us with lunch and we'll talk to some people and then we'll be back and you'll be able to go to fourth period um, and tutorial, which is on Thursday. So if you want to do that, if that sounds interesting, um, Sophomores and juniors, come talk to me tomorrow, Tuesday, and I'll give you the permission slip. Um, also, feel free uh, for any of the assignments that we're doing today, email me. I'll be um, uh, on my email a lot today, so uh, teach.stuart at gmail.com. And if you have any questions, I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, thanks. Bye.